for being able to come to your house and freely worship you. Lord, I just pray that your spirit be upon this place today. Lord, reveal to us the things that you would have revealed to us, for your word is living. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, I pray that not only that we hear, but that we take to heart the things that you would have us to hear, that we may make a difference in this world to bring glory and honor to you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So today's sermon is entitled, Knowing God's Will. That's kind of a hard thing to figure out from time to time, isn't it? But I'm going to try to make it a little bit easier for us to understand today. Last week we talked about Jesus writing letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And that he wrote these letters because he loved the churches. He loves his children. And he was giving further letters of instructions. Some of those letters were nothing but good. One of those letters was nothing but bad. But the bulk of those letters, five out of seven, Jesus had condemnation for them. He had to tell them, yes, there are these good things, but here are the faults that I find against you. That's almost 75%. But instead of saying, I don't want you anymore, I don't love you anymore, because Jesus is never, ever going to say that. He is faithful and true. He loved us enough that he left heaven, that he came and died for us. So even to those that are his own children that have turned from him, that are doing things that they should not be doing, he says, repent and turn back to me, that I love you. I love you as a child, and I am standing at the door knocking wanting an intimate relationship with you. Just please turn and come to me. Everything will be f fine. And we saw that all seven of those letters said that if you turn to Jesus, if you follow after him, that you would be victorious. Not just that you'll be saved, but that you will reign victoriously with Jesus for all eternity. That's what we get as sons and daughters of the Most High. Jesus came not only to die for us, to save us from our sins, but he came so that we could be victorious. And that starts in our life today. That's why Jesus said, I must go so that I can send the Counselor, the Holy Spirit to you, to be with you, to give you everything that you need to empower you for this life so that we can start living victoriously today. Jesus loves his church. And when we aren't doing according to what he calls us to do, he just simply asks us to repent. And we talked about repentance. We looked at how that repentance has a meaning and how it changes a little bit through the Bible and adds to it. It doesn't change as much, it just adds to it. That repentance means sorrow or regret. And then we saw that repentance meant to change directions, to die to oneself. But when Jesus Christ came, repentance took on a new meaning. It meant a total change of heart because we saw God's love becoming manifest in His only Son who came to this earth and died for us. What love the Father has that He would send His only Son to die for us. So it involves a total change of heart. And Jesus said that you must be born again, that you must be born of from above so that the old man, the old creation is gone. Behold, all things are new. We don't have to worry about our struggle over sin anymore. That doesn't mean that we won't sin, but that means that sin is not going to reign victorious, that we can reign victorious with Jesus if we'll just turn to Him, turn to Him for guidance, just tap into that power of the Spirit so that we can live a life that brings victory. Jesus loves His church. How much? Well, Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27 tells us. It says, Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's how much Jesus loves his church. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. That's the kind of life that we are called to as a body of Christ. Once we are saved, we are called in to be a part of Jesus' church. All of us are members of that, that body. All of us are given spiritual gifts that we need to use in the body. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the light of this world. And God so loved us that he sent his one and only son to die for us. And if you choose to believe and repent, then you are saved. You are born again. You don't have to worry about death because it has no sting. And you are called to live a different life. 
It's a point that's taught in the Old Testament as well as the New. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 says, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. So many times we get deceived. That's what Satan does. Don't let him get a foothold. He tells us that this is our life. This is our world. We should live the way we want. Just go for it. Just do it. You know, live for today. But our lives were never our own, even before we became saved. God created us for a purpose. He created us to be in an intimate relationship with Him. God Almighty. God who spoke and then there were stars. We have nothing that relates to the power of a star on this earth. No nuclear explosion, anything else. Our sun gives life to this planet. And it's just a small star in the scheme of things when God spoke and said, let there be life. God spoke and created life. Life that could reproduce. Life that could heal itself. And we're still amazed trying to figure out medical science, how the body works and everything. And God literally breathed and that became true. And He wanted a relationship with us. But our lives are not our own. Don't let Satan deceive you. In the New Testament, Paul talks about it even more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? He goes on to say in verses 19 through 20, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price, Therefore, honor God with your bodies. God created us, so He owns us. He owns our lives. He owns every aspect of us. And then He loved us enough that when we sin, instead of destroying us, saying game over, He said, I love you so much, I will send my Son to die for your sins. Because there's nothing that you can do, no matter how righteous you think you are, there's nothing you can do to pay that price of sinning against a righteous and holy God. And since there's not, I'll send my son to die for you instead. To pay that price. Because that's how much I love you. Even though you'll mock him and spit in his face, he will do it because he understands my will. And that's what we want to find out today is how to understand God's will. Romans 6, 4, Paul also says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We're supposed to be different when we become Christians. We're not supposed to live the same old life. The world needs to see us as changed, a change of heart, repentance, so that they can see what is true about Christianity, what makes it different than anything else, that they understand for God so loved the world. If we're not different, how will they understand that? Sure, they can look at creation and say, well, maybe there is a God and everything. But when they see a life transformed, truly changed, they say there's no explanation for that other than God. That this person has changed. Because I've seen them this way before. They lived this kind of life. But now they live this life. I want to know more about that God that they serve. But if we're not transformed, if we're not changed, then they're not going to see that. They're not going to see the light in us. Paul asked the question, don't you know? This, he was asking this of churches again because obviously they did not know. Obviously they were still living a life like the world. Maybe not all of them, maybe some of them. Maybe 75%, 5 out of 7. I don't know the percentages. But there were people who did not realize how much God loved them. What Jesus did for them on the cross, the power of the Spirit that resides in them, they took it for granted. And Paul says, do you not know? Realize this. He's also saying, does it mean so little to you that what God did for you that you can't give Him your life? He created you in the first place, but He bought you back from an eternity in hell to spend an eternity with Him as joint heirs of Christ to reign eternally with Jesus Christ. Wow. The love that the Father has for us. Jesus paid the price once and for all. We have victory. We don't have to worry. We just have to realize that. We have to change our heart. We have to seek after Him and empower ourselves with the Spirit. 
When Jesus wrote the letters to the different churches in Revelations, the ones that were doing as they should, he told them to stand firm. He told them to hold on, that it would be worthwhile, that he would never leave them or forsake them, that he would give him what they needed, that he was proud of them, but just to stand firm a little longer. Because in this life there will be trials and there will be turmoil, but Jesus is victorious and therefore we are victorious through him. <laughs> When we die, we don't have to worry about what's going to happen. We will reign eternally with Jesus. And he's saying, stand firm just a little longer. And to those who were not, like I said, he didn't say, go away from me or anything else. He said, repent and turn back to me. Here's the things you are doing right, but here's what you're doing wrong. Or in the case of the church of Laodicea, you're not doing anything right. But still, turn, repent, change your heart. And I am right here. I have never gone anywhere. I am still standing here knocking, asking for a relationship, an intimate relationship with you. That's what I want to do. So you need to change your heart and focus on Him. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ the Son. We spoke about Jeremiah. Jeremiah knew about discipline also. In Jeremiah 10.23, he said, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct your step. But in verse 24, he says, Discipline me, Lord, but only in due measure, not in your anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. See, Jeremiah knew that wisdom was fear of the Lord. He knew who God was. He knew that God reigned supreme and sovereign on his throne. Just like if your dad tells you to do something when you're a little child. He's the boss, right? Your world revolves around Him. He is the one that feeds you, clothes you, protects you and everything. That same kind of fear we should have for our Father, but yet there's that love also. That we know that God loves us so much that He just wants us to come to Him. That's why Jesus said to the Laodiceans, He said that I discipline you because I am a loving Father. A loving Father wants the best for you. And if a good earthly father wants the best for you, how much more will your heavenly father want the best for you? And he said, discipline me. Because he said, if that's what it takes, none of us like discipline. But he said, if that's what it takes for me to realize, then discipline me, O Lord. Because I don't want to turn from your ways. I don't want to live a life that's worthless. I don't want to live a life that doesn't bring glory and honor to you. So discipline me, O Lord. But please, I know who you are. Discipline me just enough. Don't destroy me. Discipline me enough to turn me back to you because I want to serve you. So for 2016, I asked you some questions last week. I asked you, what was your purpose in life? What are you living for? And what will the story of your life be? I hope you pondered it. Maybe you went back and read some of the letters in Revelation. Maybe the Spirit talked to you about some areas in your life that you needed to improve. Or maybe it reaffirmed what you are doing right so that you could stand firm and hold fast. But what will you live your life for 2016? Many people have already made New Year's resolutions and have already blown them. But I don't want us to make New Year's resolutions. I want us to stand firm in the faith that we have. To know that Jesus is there all the time and He just wants us to come to Him. To be in an intimate relationship with Him. And if we do that, maybe we can figure out what God's will is. I assume since you're here, you want to. I want to be a church. I want this to be a church where if Jesus wrote us a letter today that he wouldn't have any condemnation, that he would say, this is what you are doing right. But even if he has condemnation, then I would want this a church to say, oh, Father, forgive me, just like Jeremiah did. Show me discipline so that I may repent. Because we will make mistakes. We are sinners saved by grace. And as long as we realize that and realize at any point we can get up out of the mud and come back to Jesus, that He'll take us back. That He'll show us the right path. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. That love covers all. And we just need to learn that and turn to Him. When we watched the movie Friday, <clears throat> it mentioned about being lukewarm. Imagine that. We just talked about that Sunday. And the lady was trying to teach, the older lady was trying to teach the younger lady how to pray. And before they started praying, she said, Would you like a cup of coffee? And the younger woman said, Sure, I would. She said, Do you like your coffee hot or do you like iced coffee? 
I like my coffee hot. So she brings her out a cup of coffee and it's lukewarm. And she says, do you, do you like your coffee lukewarm? Didn't you say I like it hot? And she says, yeah, coffee hot is pleasing and coffee cold is pleasing. But lukewarm coffee is just gross, isn't it? Same point that Jesus was trying to make. It's worthless. And we don't want to live a life that is worthless. We want to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. So how do we know God's will? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament again. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So you think the New Testament will tell us anything differently? Let's look at Luke, Luke 10, 27 then. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and all your mind. But now Jesus takes it even a step further. Because He's come to this earth he came for us to realize, for us to live a life victorious. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He builds upon that. He says, let's take it even a step further. Because you can. Because I have fought the battle and I have won. Because I have sent, or I will send the Spirit to give you the power that you need. Where you can love your neighbor. He says in other parts of Scripture to love even your enemies. So Jesus isn't talking about your best buddies here. Those that you like. He's talking about even those that you can't, don't like, that you can't stand, right? He's saying, love your neighbors, because that's exactly what he did. Jesus wasn't crucified because he was a great teacher. Jesus was crucified because he taught people to repent, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. He taught something that was offensive to people. He taught that they were hypocrites when they relied on their own self-righteousness. He taught that He came to the sick to heal them when the self-righteous said, we don't want any part of that. We've lived this way. We want to know that our abilities will get us to heaven. He was offensive because He taught the truth that it's all about God and not about us. He taught us how to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He prayed in the garden that if, if the Lord, if God could take this cup away from him, if he didn't have to go through the pain and suffering that he would go, have to go through, to take that away from him. But he said, not my will, but thine, Father. It's all about God's will. We wouldn't exist if he didn't create us. And if he didn't love us enough to buy us back from an eternity in hell, then that's where we would go when we died. But all we have to do is repent to change our heart, to accept Jesus Christ, and we will reign victorious. So if Jesus came to teach us how to be sons and daughters of the Most High, then shouldn't we start living that way right this moment? And Jesus took it that step far further. We saw that in Ephesians. He said to love as He loved and gave himself for the church. Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to do anything first. God sent Jesus Christ to us. In our time of sin, in our time of shame, no matter how far away we had drifted, or how righteous we think we were, he sent Jesus to do what we would, could never do for ourselves. We can never reach God. And we sinned against a righteous, holy God who is in control of everything, who knows no boundaries of space or time or any limit to His power. And that's who we sinned against. But He loved us instead. <clears throat> what a loving God we have. Romans chapter 12 it's one of my favorite first couple verses, so is the passage. But it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, because Paul is trying to urge them to understand what God has done for them. But whenever something starts with therefore, we need to read before it, right? So let's go back to Romans 11, 33 through 36. That's the end of chapter 11. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. 
Who has known the mind of our Lord or who has been His counsel? These are taken from the Old Testament too. Nothing has changed. Verse 35, Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? <laughs> you haven't done anything that God should repay you for. It's called grace. You got what you did not deserve. Jesus Christ came to die for you once and for all because God loved you so much. You deserve the exact opposite. But God loved you enough to send Jesus so that He would die for you. For from Him and through Him and for Him are, are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Now we go straight into Romans chapter 12. Therefore, because of this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I plead with you, I beg with you, I counsel from you. Just like Jesus said to the Laodiceans, He said, I counsel you, I give you Legal counsel to buy from me the things you need rather than to look to this earth for the things that you need. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that He gave you mercy and grace instead of punishment and judgment. To do what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, that's tough to swallow, but it's exactly what He's called us to do. That's what is holy and pleasing to God. That is what is true and proper worship. So verse, verse 1 has three points that I want to make out. Maybe you want to write these down even. You don't have to, but I'm watching. Okay? There is knowing. That's number one. Knowing who God is. That He is, in, he is sovereign. He is God alone. Knowing what He did for you. That He gave you mercy instead of grace. And knowing what He expects from you. Sacrifice. Your life is not your own. He doesn't expect you to just take that gift, put it in your pocket, and go on like nothing's changed. He requires a change of heart, repentance. Second point is surrender. That means total surrender. The Bible says that we are born again, born from above. That means the old person has died. Those old ways have died. That we are born to live a life anew. Total surrender. Living sacrifice. That means we're alive, but yet we're dying every single day. That we sacrifice our wants, our needs, our desires, so that we say, not my will, but thine, Father. And the third point is living. So there's knowing, surrendering, and living. Not are we only to surrender and then do nothing, but we're to live. To live a victorious life through Jesus Christ to live a victorious life empowered by His Spirit, to live a life of worth, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. And so many times we get deceived by the devil and we don't realize these things because we say, that's hard, or that's what, not what I want to do. That's why we have to die to ourselves. And we're missing out on all of the rewards that God has called us for. We're missing out on the training to learn how to be sons and daughters of the kingdom of heaven. God loves us so much, He doesn't want us to live a life that is worthless. He wants us to live a life of worth. And even as God's children, when we're not acting the way we should, Jesus is standing there at the door saying, please, will you let me in? Wow, what a loving God. But how can we do this? Well, verse 2 excuse me, tells us the answer. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will. Get that? God's will right there. There's how. What God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the first thing is not to conform, right? What does that mean? It says not to conform to the pattern of this world. Well, Scripture tells us who the God of this world is, doesn't it? it tells us that it's Satan. It tells us that he deceives this world and those who follow after the patterns of this world, he's their God. He's their ruler. They're the ones that he serves. Jesus tells us that we can't serve two masters. That we have to decide which one we'll serve. So if you're not being a living sacrifice, then you're serving the master of this world, aren't you? Because you won't give the life that God already owns to Him in a life of service. <clears throat> Others will not see a difference 
Others will not be drawn to light either. That's the results of it. You'll live a life that you might think, that you might deceive. Like Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, He said, you think you are rich. But instead, not only are you not rich, but you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Don't be deceived. So we are not to conform to this world, but what are we supposed to do instead? To be transformed. That's from the Greek word where we get metamorphosis. It's what a little caterpillar does when they become a butterfly. And a caterpillar, yeah, it might be cute, but most kids think they're not cute, right? We're supposed to have childlike faith. So what do they do to caterpillars so often? <laughs> right? But a beautiful butterfly, they chase after, wanting to catch it and everything because of its beauty. It, it intrigues them. So we're not supposed to be something that people don't see any worth in, that some people want to squash. We want to be like that butterfly so that people say, wow, look at the difference. That butterfly was a caterpillar before. I knew what Alan was like before, and I know what he's like now. Something changed. What was it? And then I get the opportunity to tell him, my God, through Jesus Christ. So we have the opportunity all the time to witness and tell of the story, tell of the joy that we have in our heart. It's to completely undergo from one thing to another, to change totally. The old self is gone. It's dead. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. We got that word therefore though, so we've got to go back to verse 16. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Jesus was transformed before the disciples' eyes. Changed from one thing to something else. Same word. They got to see who he was. He was transfigured. They got to see his true radiance. And the Bible is telling us this here. And it's also telling us not to see people. Like Paul says, we don't fight a physical battle. We fight a spiritual battle. When we look at people out in the world, we need to see them as souls. As God's children as someone that we're called to bring the gospel message to, to that soul that may make a difference in them knowing Jesus Christ and not knowing Jesus Christ and spending an eternity apart from God or an eternity reigning with Christ. Eternity compared to this life. Why in the world would we not want to focus on things eternal? Why would we want to build up things, treasures and riches on this earth where moth destroy and thieves still. We need to build up eternal rewards. Bring glory and honor to God our Father who owns our lives anyway. And then what, how do you do that? You do that by renewing your mind. It means renovation. A complete changing in the way we think. It involves a total makeover. We have to realize in our mind that we belong to God that He owns us. We need to realize how much He loved us, that we deserved sin and separ- I mean, punishment and separation from God because of our sin. But instead, He gave us mercy and grace. That He sent His only Son, who was equal in every way, who reigned in heaven, but came to earth and was dependent upon a man and woman to take care of Him as a child. And then He died for us. That's what we need to realize. That we need to renew our mind so we think that way. So that we don't think this is my life, but this is God's life. And He loved me enough that He would give up His Son for me. So my life belongs to Him. Not my will, but God's will. Repentance involves change. Transformation involves change. Renewing involves change. So I ask you today, will you change your heart? Will you change your mind? Will you change your soul? And will you worship God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul? 
The end of that verse says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Yeah, we could get a lot more complicated in figuring out what God's will is. And we want to find that burning bush or we want to put the fleece out there and say, wet the fleece and leave the ground dry. And then we want to, that's not good enough. We want to see it change and do the opposite. But God's will is pretty clear. He created us to be in a loving relationship with Him. He is supreme. And even though we sin and rebel against Him and all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, that He loved us enough to buy us back through the blood of His Son. We need to renew our minds so that we can love God for who He is. Romans 12, 1 and 2 out of the Amplified Bible says this, and I'm going to close with this. I just like the way this read. It said, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. We'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the love that you have, that you do reign victorious, and that you loved us enough to create us and want us to be a part of that. I don't understand it, Lord, but I thank you for it. It just mind boggles me that you would choose to love a sinner such as I. And Lord, I just pray here that your spirit comes upon each one here, that, that we do change our hearts, change our minds, God to make a difference, especially in this year of 2016. Lord, let us look back after this year is over and see the change that was made. See the differences that resulted of that, that we were a light to this world, that we sought your will, O oh God, rather than our own, because you love us so much. We thank you for Jesus coming and setting things right, and we thank you for the power of your Spirit. Lord, I just praise your name. And I thank you for victory through Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Stand with us for our closing song. Make me broken so, so I, I can, can be healed. Cause, Cause I'm so callous. Now I can't feel. I want to run to you with arms wide open. Make me broken. Make me empty so I can be filled. Cause I'm still holding onto my will. And I'm completed when you are with me. Make me empty. Tell you are my one desire. Tell you are my one true love. Tell you are my breath, my everything. Lord, please keep making me. Make me lonely so I can be yours till I want no one more than you, Lord.
is in the darkness, I know you will hold me, make me lonely, tell you why my one desire, tell you why my one true love, tell you why my breath, my Making, Lord, please keep making me. Till you are my one desire. Till you are my one true love. Till you are my breath, my everything. I know you'll keep making Oh, please keep making me